Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at Noah, God remembering him, in Genesis chapter 8 in our continuing study of the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 7, verse 15, you have God shutting the door, and it rains for 40 days and, and for 40 nights. And what I want you to notice is the symmetry of the numbering that's described in this account of the flood. So you have God shutting the door, it rains for 40 days and 40 nights, then you come to verses 18 and 20, and the waters increase until the mountains are covered. Uh, and then we read of how water prevails for 150 days. That's Genesis chapter 7, verses 21 through 24. So uh, we start off with 40 days and 40 nights, and then we come to 150 days where waters prevail. And the pivotal point, I'm going to come back to this, in Genesis chapter 8, verse 1, is that God remembers Noah. But then after that, we read about how the waters begin to abate, and that takes another 150 days. Uh, that that mention is mentioned in, in Genesis chapter 8, verse 3. And the waters continue to decrease until the mountains become visible. So again, there's uh, the mention of the mountains. And then finally, we read in chapter 8, verse 6, that at the end of 40 days, Noah opens the window. So I have 40 days and 40 days. 40 days at the beginning, 40 days at the end. I have the, a reference to the mountains. I have a reference to the mountains. I have in verses, chapter 7, verse 21 through 24, 150 days of water prevailing. And again, the waters abate for 150 days. And the, the pivotal point in that whole story is where God remembers Noah. So let's look at chapter 8, verse 1. it is Genesis chapter 8 verse 1 but God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark and God caused a wind to pass over the earth and the water subsided now notice when it says that God remembered Noah it's not that God had forgotten oh gee where did I put him it's not that sort of thing but rather that destruction had come and now we're going to see a picture of God acting in a way that shows that Noah hasn't been forgotten that, that God's attention is going to be on Noah. And to do that, God's going to cause a wind to pass over the earth. Now, that word for wind, we've seen that word back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, where we read that the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And that word spirit, ruach is the word, is the same word that's used here for wind, ruach. And so, we could say we could even say that God caused a spirit, although I think the sense of wind is appropriate here. But it's a return to this idea of creation. Now in Genesis chapter six we had where God warned Noah in chapter seven. Now, uh, he delivers Noah through the ark. In chapter 8 now, he remembers Noah. In chapter 6, we had the building of the ark. In chapter 7, the ark was used to save Noah from the flood. And now we're going to see the ark coming to rest in the mountains of Ararat. When I say it, come, he, it comes to rest, remember that Noah's name means rest. In chapter 6, we saw the picture of Noah building the ark. In chapter 7, he was in the ark, and now he's going to come out of the ark. In chapter 6, the earth was filled with violence. In chapter 7, the earth was, well, I guess you could say it was filled with water. And now, as Noah comes out of the ark, he's going to be told to go out and fill the earth. Genesis 8, 4, in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, notice how exact we are, just as in the giving of the flood, uh, when the floodwaters came in chapter 7, verse 11, we had in the 600th year of Noah's life. Now in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark rested upon the mountains of Ararat. Now there is a mountain that you can go to in, in eastern Turkey, and it's, it's been given the title the Mount Ararat. But that's not where we're told the ark landed. Instead, we read that it landed upon the mountains, plural, of the land of Ararat. And Ararat was not just a single mountain. Ararat was an entire region. Uh, they referred to it in the ancient world as Urartu. But that's the same place where the Hebrew refers to here as Ararat.
and it's not a single mountain it's a land so you know people that are always going up to Mount Ararat to look for the ark I, I think they're probably looking in the wrong place plus remember that that Noah had um, you know many different kind of animals at least two of every kind plus plus seven of the clean animals we're gonna see why in just a moment and that probably would have included two termites you know so they probably uh, you know reproduce and, and just had a field day and also once you've come out of the ark you're going to need some building supplies so the first place you're going to look is to that ark so I don't imagine the ark would continue in existence to this day wood normally doesn't last that long now we come to the question, what's the significance of the various sorts of birds being sent out? Where Noah sends out a, uh, a raven and he sends out a dove and the raven just continues going out looking but the dove returns and then it returns with an olive branch in its mouth. What is the significance of the story, the, the telling of the story of these birds being sent out? If, if we go back to Genesis chapter 1, we also had reference not specifically yes you had the creation of birds but way back in chapter 1 verse 2 where the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters but it moved it brooded it fluttered and it's the language that's used later on in Deuteronomy of an eagle hovering over its young and so again the description of the birds takes us back to the Spirit of God doing his work at the very outset of creation. We come to Genesis chapter 8 verses 15 through 17. Then God spoke to Noah saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. There had been eight people in, in total in the ark. Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may breed abundantly on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. Now, that reference, that command to be fruitful and multiply, that's an echo of what God had said back in Genesis chapter 1. So we're retelling the story. We're sort of jump-starting again. You know, we could call this creation, uh, creation 2.0. Uh, we're doing it again as they come out of the ark. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord. Now, we have read previously of sacrifices where, where Cain and Abel each brought sacrifices, but this is the first reference to an altar, a structure on which the sacrifice goes. And he took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. So now we see the reason for the clean animals and the clean birds. There, there was a distinction made. Uh, and and we, we haven't read yet in Genesis uh, what that entails, but the readers of this have already gone through not just Genesis but Exodus and Leviticus they know the difference between clean and unclean animals because they're living it as they're reading this and so the idea of clean and unclean didn't start in Leviticus it starts all the way back here uh, we see it here in the book of Genesis and the Lord smelled the soothing aroma Noah offers a sacrifice and that's a burnt offering an ascending offering and we see the picture of God smelling the aroma where not only do you do you hear the worship not only do you see the worship you smell the worship and the Lord said to himself I will never again curse the ground on account of man for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth you know it's not you know even though mankind very well may have gone back to the days like it was before Noah and sin just as much and maybe even sin more uh, and yet and yet God says I'm not going to destroy every living thing as I have done and so he says I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done and then we have a song almost it's given in stanza while the earth remains seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease now that's going to be codified in the next chapter in the giving of a covenant but here even before the covenant is uh, comes about we're given this promise that life will continue until well we'll see the until at some other time Remember what we saw last time in Second Peter, 
where God says there's coming a day of another sort of judgment. But until that comes, things are going to continue. Seed time, harvest, cold, heat, summer, winter, day, night. And that creation ordinance will continue until the coming of the Lord.